Thank you. Good to be saved, right? Good to be in church. Good to see me. My mom never even said amen to that one. I got to tell you. Hey, just a thought. You know, preacher was talking about cold. Um, Brother Nick Serino, uh, I was up with him. And, and if you've ever been up into uh, Point Hope, I'm pretty sure the last half of the sign fell off. Hope less. Uh, it was 60 below. That was the, that was the temperature. That was not the wind chill. And his church faces one street. You come around and his house faced the other, the one he was living in. And so he's only got to walk out his back door and go to the front door of the church. And he said, he said, I got, I got dressed up, but he said, I didn't put anything over my face. And he said, I breathed in and it seared my lungs and I went down. And he said, my, my family will think that I'm at the church. He said, he'd be dead in about 20 minutes and literally crawled uh, into his church to save his life. And the reason I say that is because what missionaries put up with on a daily basis you know, they may tell us, pray for somebody I'm witnessing to, or pray for church property or something like that, but, but literally, especially in the Arctic, every day is life-threatening. And so uh, do, do remember our missionaries in prayer, like the preacher said. Uh, I, want you to, I want you to turn in your Bible to one place. We'll turn several places, but I want you to turn first place to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to look at a verse, <clears throat> a couple of verses here. Um, I think the preacher was pointing these out the other day. And um, have, you ever, have you ever had your attention over here and you didn't notice something over here? All right, so we're going to read these passages. You're going to see, I know where your attention is. It says this, uh, verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, Democrat. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I was, <clears throat> I, was, I was hearkening back to the original. Idolatry, witchcraft, uh, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, reviling, uh, and such like. I like the I like the postscript. So we're going to read that, and then we'll have a word of prayer, and then we're going to we're going to get into this me- this message that I just downloaded a half an hour ago. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you, God, for your very great kindness, Lord God. You are never a failure. You are never a failure, God. Um, you are kind to us all day long. You are merciful to us all day long. Uh, you are gracious. God, if you did no more than those three, we would be rich and secure all of our lives. So, Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you, God, that we could be here tonight. Uh, thank you, God, that uh, we have you as our God. Thank you for the good health you've given all of us come here tonight. Now, Lord, these folks came here, like I said before, Lord, they came here for two reasons. They want something from you. They want something from your book, and if they don't get it tonight, it'll be my fault. So what they need you to do is get Sam Gipp out of of their way, out of your way, that you might speak to their hearts, God, and accomplish something to your glory uh, in their lives. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Now, uh, I think we all do this when we look at this. Uh, We look at, um, well, all of it, Uh, uh, let's see, adultery, fornication, uncleanness. We look at all of those things. And, and usually we kind of check off the ones that we're not in any danger of, which, I, you know, when I look at that, that list, I think I'm okay, all right? That's such like that gets me messed up, all right? And so when we're looking at all of those, those, all those sins in that list, you know, the, we're, we're watching these sins. Notice I'm pointing to this sign. But you guys, especially the front row. Anyway, while we're looking at these sins, we miss something in verse 19. Look at, look at verse 19 again. Now the works of the, what's the word? Doesn't say the devil. I mean, if you have been tempted to do any of those, haven't you thought to, thought to yourself, oh, oh man, the devil wants me to do this. The devil, wants, the devil wants me to drink. The devil wants me to get on drugs. The devil wants me to commit adultery. The, the devil wants me to kill somebody. I don't need the devil's help for some folks, okay? But anyway, no. The Bible says those are the works of the flesh. You know what that means? That means that if the devil died today, before the Lord came back, some, some Christians would still do those things. You say, why? Because when the devil dies or the devil goes away, uh, you still got your flesh. Isn't that true? You know, I don't know if you think what you, what you think of the millennium, but the millennium uh, is, is not the new heaven and earth. It is this world we live in right now with two differences. You know what they are? The devil's locked up for a thousand years, and Jesus Christ is the one world government 
in Jerusalem, and he has to rule with a rod of iron. That's how nice a millennium is. And it's so, that, listen, you know what that's to prove? That is to prove, first off, number one, you can't, for a thousand years, nobody can say, the devil made me do it. Secondly, you're going to find out that a whole lot of the wickedness that we blame on the devil, and I'm not his, look, I'm not his advocate. I don't want to be his advocate. Don't ever say that. You know, when somebody says to me, you know, I'm talking to them, they go, well, let me be the devil's advocate for a minute. You know, I hear, I hear them, let me be the devil. Why would you think, you know, like you are the advocate for the devil. You got to make sure that his side gets presented. I don't want to be his advocate, okay? But a lot of what we blame him for, he wasn't even in town that weekend, okay? He was surprised when he found out what you did, all right? And uh, you're going to have the devil locked up, but when he gets out after a thousand years, he's got a bunch of people ready to fall in that fast. Because without him, look at what our flesh is capable of. The reason I'm showing you this is because I'm going to talk to you tonight about, say, well, if the devil doesn't want me to do that, what does he want me to do? But that's what I was hoping you would ask. And so I'm going to talk to you tonight about, about what the devil actually wants you to do. Now, uh, you know, sometimes we, we preachers, we, we come up with a great sermon. We just need Bible for it. And, and I tell the guys in Preparation of Liberty, the greatest sermon text in the world is, is John 11, 35, Jesus wept. You can preach anything from that, from that verse. Jesus wept because you didn't win enough souls. And Jesus wept because you didn't tithe. And Jesus wept because you missed church last week. Jesus wept because you disagreed with me. I mean, Jesus is crying all the time, okay, with that, with that text. But the way we know what the devil wants us to do is real simple. Find out what he wanted somebody to do in the Bible. And so we're going to look at four places. And here's, here's the sad thing. People in this room who will never, ever, ever do any one of the things we just read in verse 19, 20, and 21, because you don't want the devil to run your life, be surprising how many times we've done exactly what he wanted. All right? Now, the first one, and we're actually going in chronological order. That's an amazing thing. Uh, I want you to go to Genesis chapter 3. You certainly know where we're going. <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 3, And it says this, Now the serpent was more subtle than a beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree, uh, of every tree of the garden. And then you know, uh, you know what uh, uh, Eve does. She kind of complains, adds to the word of God. She says this, The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Well, it doesn't say they couldn't touch it. I think that's good advice. I mean, if you shouldn't drink, why would you want to hold a bottle of wine? Oh, well, it doesn't say I can't touch it. What? Yeah, but the longer you touch it, the closer you come to messing up, okay? But the first thing that God wants you to do is not be, be loyal to the Word of God. Question what God said. Now, the reason that is important, I, look, look, we are Bible believers, we are King James Bible believers, okay? And, and I've said this before, there's no King James issue. People say there's a King James issue. There's not a King James issue. There is a quote-unquote perfect Bible issue. Because if all those King James guys, uh, if all of us tonight agreed and said, you know, the King James Bible does have mistakes in it. Yeah, you know, it's just really not perfect. All the anti-King James guys would say amen very loudly, right? And then we finish by saying, yeah, the King James is not the perfect word of God. The English Standard Version is the absolute perfect word of God without a mistake. Everybody that's anti-King James would be anti-English Standard Version tomorrow. It's not the King James Bible. It is a perfect Bible that they don't believe in. All right? They don't. You say, why? Well, because, you know, the Spirit, the Spirit, and, and this, is not, uh, this is not trying to be an ugly thing or slapping at them, <clears throat> But the spirit of Bible correctors and the spirit of evolutionists is very much similar. Uh, there are two kinds of evolutionists. There's the, there's the 12, 12 guy that comes out at uh, 12th grade, uh, you know, third grade level education. But uh, 12th grade, I uh, doesn't know what, what gender he is. But anyway, uh, he believes in evolution. You know why? He believes it with his brain because they just put it in here for, 11, uh, for 12 years. You deal with that kid's brain. You show him some things and make him think, and he gets, he gets rid of evolution. And then there's the second kind of evolution. It's, that is the guy that's teaching it. He knows the fossil record does not teach evolution. He 
knows that all that stuff. He knows, you know, the strata, the strata, you see, you know, this, this, this. You know, there's not a place on earth that the strata is in the order they put in a book. There's not one place on the planet. In fact, as in uh, Cody, Wyoming, Cody, Wyoming, uh, there's a mountain called Heart Mountain. I think it's H-A-R-T, Heart Mountain. And uh, there's a verse in, in uh, Job, I've got it marked. <clears throat> but you know what the, the thing about Heart, Heart Mountain is? The strata is completely upside down. It is like that mountain has been turned upside down. And in Job it says he turneth the mountains upside down. So maybe that's what happened. <clears throat> Which put the, uh, put the mercury outboard at the top of the mountain instead of the bottom. But, but anyway, um, you got that, you got the evolutionist that teaches it. You know why he believes in evolution? Not because he, he, the facts teach it, not because a fossil record teaches it, because it doesn't. It's the alternative. Well, of course evolution is true, because if evolution isn't true, then the Bible's true. If the Bible's true, then I'm a sinner, and I'm going to die and go to... I believe in evolution. Bible correctors are the same way. There's two kinds of Bible correctors. Oop, I just did... I did if you're on the... I, this is not a satanic... This is... This... Okay, i got to do this. I actually did... I was preaching one time, I wanted to say two. And I knew if I did this, somebody out there would say, oh, he did a satanic symbol, so I, I went two. And somebody said, that's a satanic symbol, so two. Okay, two. Two. Like your IQ. Two. Anyway, uh, Bible correctors, there's two kinds of those. There's the guy that comes out of Bible college. He's had three years of, of programming to believe there's mistakes in the Bible. He believes it with his head. You show him why he's wrong. Show him where the perfect Bible is. You deal with his brain, and you get him straightened out. Then there's the guy that taught him, and he knows the Greek manuscripts do not support the modern translations. He knows, it, this guy, you know how many manuscripts out of 6,006, and that is the number. You had a 6,006 manuscripts, do you know how many of those uh, uh, read that agree with the modern translations? 58. Not even a hundred. And he knows it. You know why he believes that there's not a perfect Bible on this earth? Because it's the same thing. It's a hard issue with him. It's, well, of course there's not a perfect Bible on this earth. Because if, the, if there was a perfect Bible, then I'd be obligated to read it. And if I read it, I've got to change my life. And I can't quit. I've got to quit. quit uh, you know, there's no perfect Bible. It is the same spirit. All right? And so if you're here tonight, or if you're listening in, and you don't believe the King James Bible is the Word of God, I am not saying you are the devil. Moving along... No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm really not saying, I don't believe you're the devil. But you are doing what he wants you to do. Okay? I mean, there are some things, you know, I, I always tell people, I said, if, you know, like Democrats, if they are not run by the devil, what else would he want them to do? Okay? And so, if you, listen, the devil wants to destroy faith in the word and the words of God. Is that not true? And how does it come? Does it not come? You have God said? Well, yeah, but I mean, why do you say, do you know if the, if the original language really read that way? Oh, yea, have God said. And those people always have a question. And when they're done, they don't have a Bible. In fact, again, I probably said this. Let me ask you something. Uh, I already know the answer to this. Are you creationists? Okay, the 25 of you. I'm in the wrong church. I think I'm in the wrong church. Are you, you guys creationists? Okay. Would you, as a creationist, would you want to be mistaken for an evolutionist? No. Because we're, we're not only creationists, we are dedicated to it, correct? Would an evolutionist, I'm talking about, not, I'm, not talking about the, I'm not talking about the kid with the brain coming out of 12th grade, I'm talking about the guys that teach us stuff. Would an evolutionist want to be mistaken for a creationist? No. So if what we believe that there's a perfect Bible, uh, it's been called cult, it's been called a heresy. I can't think of anything else. I probably got a whole list of them, adjectives of what we are and aren't. But if it's a cult uh, and, and it's, a, it's a, uh, uh, a heresy, how come every other Christian who doesn't believe there's a perfect Bible wants to be mistaken for us? How come they'll stand behind a pulpit and say all day long, the Bible doesn't have one mistake in it? I've heard them say it. And I tell people, don't get too impressed by what we say behind here. Everybody knows what. You don't know this, but there's like, there's like one cubic or one square foot right here, and it's magic, because when you stand here, the Bible is perfect. And when you get down there, you can't find the book you were talking about up there. And so when a guy says, you know, well, he must believe the Bible, because when he was preaching, he said the Bible's without a mistake. Don't, don't buy that. 
You know what, what happens when you, you see the guy down on the floor and you say, that perfect Bible you talk about, that was perfect? Oh yeah, that's a perfect Bible. Oh yeah, well, where is that book you're talking about? Now, I am not into poetry. Okay? I just, I'm sorry, when I see poetry, I want to throw up. I know if you write poetry, that's fine. If you hate me, show it to me. But um, I, am, I am not into poetry. But a guy just preached this you know, ah, real message on the Word of God, and then you ask him where the book he's talking about is, and suddenly he becomes a poet. Well, brother, it's out there. Well, go get it. <laughs> you, look, anybody in this church can come down here after the pastor gets done, our pastor, after he gets done speaking, and say, that perfect Bible you're talking about, can you put it in my hand? He'll put his in your hand. Amen. Now, you don't get to keep it. Get your own. But, hey, I can put the perfect Bible that I'm talking about in your hand. It's, it's right here. Amen. It's not, oh, there. So as soon as you ask somebody where the Bible is, when they wax poetic, you've got a poet. You don't have a Bible believer. And so, so the devil wants us to just not have complete faith that what it said, it really meant. And here you are. Now look, I'm not saying, well, somebody's out there going, oh man, I've been trying not to get on booze, and I've been trying to commit adultery, and, and, and I've, been, I've been having a lot of faith in the book. Well, I may as well just go have adultery and drink. <laughs> no, don't do the works of the flesh. But don't do what the devil does. Don't do, don't do what he wants you to do. Man, you know, nothing makes me sadder than the thought that I would do something that would put a smile on his face. So, the devil wants you to question the Word of God. That's what he wants. Uh, the, the second thing that he wants you to do, go to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. <clears throat> and I, you know, I always, uh, I'm always amused by the book of Job. For the, because there's two misunderstandings about the book of Job most Christians have. The first one is, I don't want to become so spiritual that the devil asked to do to me what he asked to do to Job. Okay. Let's put it on the table. You are probably not in danger of becoming that spiritual. All right? <clears throat> Secondly, the devil never asked anything. He didn't even bring up the, the, the subject of Job. God did. And look what he says. Look at verse uh, 6. Chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from being the Democratic headquarters, and, oh, I'm, I, I'm, excuse me, uh, from going to and fro on the earth, from, from walking up and down in it, and the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? God brought the, brought, God brought the subject of Job up. You know why? I like my God, I really do. And, and you know, you fear the devil, which you, you know, don't pick a fight with him, but fear the Lord, okay? But you know what the Lord can do? You know what you can do that he can do? He can play with them. Uh, uh, Job chapter 41, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, read those verses. And it says, he can play with them as a bird. And I think the devil showed up, and I think God looked at that and says, I think I'll put a stick in his eye. And he went fishing. He threw this bait out there, and he says, I'll consider my servant Job. Plunk. Man, the devil took it. Job is going to be the stick. Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect, upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil? And look at, the, look at the devil in verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and, and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Every time I read verse 9, you know what I hear? Now, I actually have never heard this sound. You know when you go fishing, and a fish bites, and it goes, Wee! Yeah, I've, I've gone fishing. I have never heard that sound. <laughs> I've heard the splash when the whole reel goes into the lake. But I have never heard that. But it, I've heard that it happens. And every time I hear, every time I read verse 9, I see the Lord just, he drops that bait right in front of the devil. And he goes, and off he goes. And I, every time I read verse 9, I hear, <laughs> guys, if you think about it, God wanted to put a stick in the devil's eye and he chose Job to be the stick, that's one of the greatest compliments any man has ever had. In fact, and I don't want to be on the, I don't want to be in the, like the list of, uh, 
of prospects, but if God wanted to put a stick in the devil's eye today, would we even be on the list? But look what, look what the devil wants him to do. Watch. Verse 10. Hast thou not made a hedge about him, about his house, about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he'll commit adultery. And he'll kill somebody. And he'll get into witchcraft. Look what it says. And the curse thee of thy face. Now, wouldn't you, wouldn't you think that the devil wants Job to do the worst thing you possibly do? I mean, I don't think, you know, uh, you know Job, uh, you, you touch what he has, and he'll hijack somebody's internet. <laughs> he'll park outside a business and get their Wi-Fi. Oh, no, I don't, think, I don't think he's interested in that. I think he wants to really, I mean, it, he wants it to be the epitome of what a man can do. That's bad. And he didn't say, he didn't say anything you read in, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20 and 20. He never said one of those. You know what he said? It cursed you your face. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands. I'll put mine up. And, and I, I don't know how many times I have to put it up, okay, over 52 years being saved. But I say it this way. You ever, you ever go out behind the barn? And look up to heaven and say something to God you probably shouldn't have said because you were just a little mad because of the circumstance of your life. Now, I always recommend you do that out behind the barn for two reasons. Number one, listen, if, if you're mad at God, you know what you don't want to do? You don't want to stand up and say, well, I just want you all people to know that I prayed and God has an answer and he has an answer and he didn't believe the book. And then, and then that night he takes care of it. Now, what do you got to do? Next service. Uh, you know, I'm sorry. Go behind the barn. Then you'll be the only one who knows you're an idiot. <laughs> the second thing, if he really gets tired of your lip, he'll only burn the barn. <laughs> when that lightning flash comes down, say, so, you know, it's strange. The barn burned, but it looks like it hit just behind it by those smoldering shoes. <laughs> so if you're going to say something ugly to God, but come on, have you never said anything ugly to God? Oh, you say you love me, you let this happen? My, my. You can say that all day long. Never murder anybody. People who would never murder anybody. People in this room who would never take a drink. People who would never take a, a pill or a shot. People who would never commit adultery. People who would never do all those terrible things. We're fighting the works of the flesh. And please, fight the works of the flesh, okay? And then we'll curse God, drop the hat. You say, are you sure that's a problem? I know that's a problem because look at chapter 2. Chapter 2, look at verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, when, uh, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Now, I'm going to say this. You ever, hear, you ever hear anybody say, God believes in balance? You can't find one verse in the Bible that says God believes in balance. He believes in moderation. He believes in temperance. He does not believe in balance. How many of you are abortionists? Oh, well, I think we need to get as many abortionists as we have non-abortionists here. I mean, we, we believe in balance, right? Uh, I wonder how many homosexuals we have here. Please, don't put up your hand. <laughs> well, we got, if you're not a homosexual, we've got to go out and get a bunch. I mean, as many so we can have it balanced. You know, that's how the contemporary movement got started. It kept talking about God being a God of balance. There's, no, there's nothing in the Bible. Wouldn't you know they, they start a whole movement on a word that isn't even in the Bible? God didn't believe in balance. But this day he did. Because the devil shows up. You know what happened? He just got a stick in his eye in chapter 1. And he shows up. And he's got a, you ever get, you're like a bloodshot eye? Black eye. And God looks at him and says, He only has one. I'm going to try that balance thing. <laughs> and he, now here's the thing. I mean, I don't want to call him stupid, but God didn't even use different bait. Look at verse, verse 3. Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth, a perfect, a bright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil? You know where you heard those words before? Genesis chapter 1, or, or Job chapter 1, verse 8. That's the same, or say verse 6, that's the same, that's the same bait. Now, I say this. I'm for sure, if I do ever catch anything, I'm not releasing it. Okay? 
What if it's too small to eat? I'll bury it in the backyard and put an ear of corn over top of it. I'm going to get something for this. But there are people that are into catch and release. Catch and release. See, when I was a kid, I wish the police believed in that. But anyway, I'm not into catch and release. But could you imagine somebody's into catch and release? Now, think for a second that you are a fish. You are a fish. Say, so were you doing a fish? No, I was Lori Lightfoot. Anyway, um, but I can't look at both walls at the same time. Anyway, uh, I hate to tell you this, but did you know that her brother and I used to run the streets of Maslin? She's from Maslin, Ohio. I should have killed her when she was a kid. <laughs> but um, could you imagine being a fish? And you see like a really, now I have a hard time saying a worm looks appetizing. They want us to think that. But you say, oh man, like, okay, oh, there's a burger. And you grab the burger, all of a sudden, oh, you feel something. Punch a hole in your jaw, and mm, you're slugging. Then you're dangling in the air. Fish are not made to do that. And then somebody takes you, rips the hook out, and throws you back in the water. <laughs> and the very next day, you see a really good looking burger. I mean, don't, this is where deja vu, see deja vu was not a word yet, that's why the Satan fell for this. I mean, don't you think when he heard this, hast thou considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth, a perfect right, uh, right man, one that feareth God and eschewth evil? Don't you think about that time, he should have said, whoa, deja vu, that makes my eye hurt. But no, because the Lord sweetens the bait a little bit. And still he holds it fast in integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And what? Verse 4, you know what you hear. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Does that not sound childish? I mean, the, the crocs of evil in the universe, the, the pinnacle of evil, and his line is, Skin for skin. I'll throw sand in your face. Skin for skin. All that a man hath will he give for his life, but put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. Did you notice the devil didn't even pick a secondary goal? He didn't say in the, in the first chapter, you take what he's got. He thought he was a Baptist. Take what he's got and curse your face. And when he didn't do it, then in the second chapter, he said, okay, okay, how about, uh, how about just maybe get drunk? No. No. It was the same thing. He wanted to curse God. Guys, we're over here. We're, we're, and look, I, again, I, you know, you say, well, the devil was tempting me. Well, maybe he was, but maybe he wasn't even in the room. Maybe it's just your flesh. Because you know what the devil wants you to do? He wants you to question that book, Genesis chapter 3. He wants you to say something ugly to this God that you sing about how you love. I mean, again, guys, you know, I say don't buy everything that a preacher says behind a pulpit because he can't find the book that he's talking about when he gets down there. But how about you can't find the love for Jesus Christ 10 minutes outside the church? You're on your way home and, you know, a wheel bearing goes in your car and you drop a wheel. And you go, well, that's great. It's the only car I got and I'm going to be at work tomorrow. Well, thanks a lot. I mean, guys, there's more to love than singing. Isn't that true? And so all he wants us to do is say something ugly to this God. It didn't say about him. It said to him. And I, I'm telling you guys, I am not exempt from this, okay? And I'm not innocent of this. I, I tell you, I, I do love the Lord, but well, there have been some times I've had to go back behind a barn and say, sorry what I said. And thanks for, not, thanks for not taking me out yesterday when I stood here and shook my fist at heaven. Thanks for not giving me what I had coming. Guys, you know, as I, the older I get, the three words that, 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 that I, I'm telling you, I just want to jump up and down and rejoice over every single day are the grace of God, the mercy of God, and the kindness of God. And the mercy. What if God shot a lightning bolt down on every person in this room. This means this pulpit would be empty at this moment. <clears throat> every one of us in this room that said something ugly to God, 
What if he'd have taken us out when we did it? I wonder how many people would be left. We probably only have some of these children. And they'd be running around and say, who are we supposed to get money from? <laughs> There's no one here. So, you might think the devil wants you to get drunk. Man, you don't need the devil to do that. You can do that on your own. He wants you to, he wants you to say something ugly about God. Look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. <clears throat> And this is when the Lord was being tempted of the devil. And we'll just go down to verse uh, 5. And the devil, taking him up <clears throat> into a high mountain, showed in him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Obviously, he had a wide screen. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. You know what the Lord, what the devil wants you to do? He wants you to worship him. Now, I know what you just said. Oh, no, no problem there. I'm never going to worship him. You know how you worship him? By going after power and glory. Guys, I know the love of money is the root of all evil, but you know what's wrong with our government? It's not just the love of money. It's the love of glory and power. Did you ever notice that all the things the Bible promises a Christian, glory and power, power and glory, are not in the list? But we have got people, they like power. Do they not like power? Do you ever see a guy, I mean, you ever see a cop that had a badge this wide and this big, and he wanted you to know? Yeah. Say, what is it? He likes power. Dictators like power. Oh, they like to say, do this, and if you don't do it, we'll put you in jail. That's what a dictator says. So they like power, and they like glory. Isn't it funny they all make themselves a general in an army that they're not in? Why don't they make themselves a private? They never make themselves a private, because there's no glory in being a private. Guys, if you have ever found yourself, come on, if you have ever found yourself saying, boy, if, if I can do this, I'll have power over so-and-so. Boy, if I, if I can do this, isn't that, isn't that what's wrong about our corporate ladder? I want to get higher and higher and higher so I have more power over more people. And so if you've ever said, boy, if I could just, if I could just get that. You know, some guys, they want a pastor because they want a power. They want to they run something. They want, they want power. And they want glory. Now, you say, well, I, I never openly worshipped him. Were you after power and glory? Because I got news for you. Those are the only, he's the only one that offers those two. Can anybody say Hollywood? Can anybody say Washington, D.C.? I mean, is that not the two? Is that not the two places where people go for power and glory? That's it. You know, I had a, <clears throat> my youth, you, my youth department. I had a young man, and he was a good basketball player. He really was a good basketball player. Now, he was a spiritual, I would say it's this pulpit, but I'll give this pulpit more credit. He was a spiritual as an old dead tree, tree stump out somewhere, okay? I mean, he, he didn't have a spiritual bone in his body. He came in one day, and did you ever notice when the unspiritual act spiritual, they talk different? Pastor, I, I need to talk to you about something that God has put on my heart. If he hears that, I bet when he hears that, he thinks, not another one. <laughs> so he came in my office one day and he sat across my desk and he goes, Brother Gibb, I, I just want to let you know I, I just gave my basketball talent to God. Stupid me. I didn't even know he was getting up a team. And, and he, I said, oh. I said, you gave your basketball talent to God. Yes. I said, it's his to do with as he wishes now, right? Yes. Now, you know what he means. Here's what, he's pre Here's what he said. Okay. Take my basketball talent and go. Force wealth and fame on me. Right? I mean, he had surrendered to be a millionaire. I, I got to tell you guys, I am working on my second million dollars. I am. I'm working on my second million. I, I gave up on my first. Anyway, um, 
And so I said, uh, I said, I said, you gave your basketball talent to God. Yes, it's his to do with as he pleases. Yes, I said, what if he tells you never play basketball again? I mean, it was the fastest NBA contract failure you ever saw. He went, I'll play anyway. I could just see God up in heaven going, Gip, I finally get a halfback or a quarterback or whatever they are in basketball. Because <laughs> if they don't have halfbacks and quarterbacks, I don't care about the game, okay? <laughs> he's, I'm telling you, he, uh, you know, and I doubt he's rich and I doubt he's famous. Uh, I don't watch basketball, but those few times that I've, I've seen a game, I haven't noticed him. He wanted power and glory. You want power and glory. Now, and here's the problem. Did, the pastor, I think, pointed out, he had the power to do this, didn't he? The devil had the power to give him power and glory. So, Jesus gave up on power and glory. Boy, he missed a shot, didn't he? He had an opportunity, and he... Let it just blow away in the wind. Yeah. He, he passed on power and glory. Oh, let's see. Look at verse 14. This is right. Verse, verse 13. And when the devil had ended all temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the... Oh, look at that word. Power of the Spirit. Isn't that funny? He gave, he gave up. He passed on power from the devil... And he got power from God. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the, all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being, my, my, what a, what a choice of words the King James translators chose. Glorified of some, of a bunch, of basketball fans, of all. You know what our problem is with power and glory? We think this is my one shot at it, and if I don't go for it, I'll never have power and I'll never have glory. What you understand is if you'll pass on the devil's offer, look at what God does. And that time Jesus got it from the right, the right source. So I know, look, look, I'm telling you, don't take drugs, okay? And, 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 and don't, uh, don't hate, and don't, please don't murder, because you're going to ruin somebody's day. And don't commit adultery. And don't commit fornication. But don't question this book. And don't curse God when you get angry at him. Because come on, you know, if, you say, if you've never been angry, you've been saved about three minutes. Because you are going to be angry at him again before we get out of here. So don't say anything ugly to him when he doesn't follow your script. And don't seek power and glory. And then there's one last Look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, and if you will, get Ezekiel chapter 28. And we'll go there first. Revelation chapter 12 and Ezekiel chapter 28. In Ezekiel chapter 28, you find it in your Bible right after Ezekiel chapter 27. Now this, uh, this and Isaiah 14 are the two longest passages in Scripture about Lucifer, about the son of the morning, uh, about Satan, uh, about the anointed cherub that covereth. He has a lot, of, uh, a lot of descriptions. And look what it says. Um, verse uh, 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of, of Tyrus and say unto him, uh, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. I don't think the king of Tyrus that was walking the earth at that time was in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Let me just back onto that verse a little bit. Um... I am not in favor of stained glass windows. I was raised in a Catholic church and they had all these stupid stained glass windows. But I'm not talking about those mosaics where you know you got somebody praying in the garden or, or whatever. I'm talking about just like you took a sheet of red glass and threw it down. And you took a sheet of blue glass and threw it down and green and, and gold or whatever. And then just 
made a mosaic with no pattern whatsoever. Let me ask you a question. How come stained glass is associated with churches? Did you ever wonder why? Why is stained glass associated with churches? The Bible says, look at verse 14, Thou art the, united, the anointed cherub that covereth. Here was the throne of God, and Lucifer's job, he was the anointed cherub that covereth, he was above the throne. He knew what his job was? His job was he was covered. Think about, look, you ever been in one of those rooms where they got a disco ball and they shine a light on it and it spins, you see all that light? You ever see that? <laughs> Preacher, we have a discipline problem. <laughs> I want you, you're going to busy, be busy tomorrow. You all need to come and see the preacher tomorrow. <laughs> but imagine if it wasn't just mirrors. What if it was gold? And what if it was diamonds and sapphires? All those colors. That's what the devil's job was. He manifests the light of God and everybody saw it. And, and so actually that, that those colors associated with God, maybe that's why we got stained glass in some churches. I'm not talking about the, I'm not talking about the ones that, you know, that, that are pictures. I'm talking about just arbitrary stained glass. I am not pushing for opening uh, or building a church and putting stained glass windows in. I'm just telling you, I think that's where the stained glass comes associated with it. Thou art the anointed chair that covereth, verse 14, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy, uh, holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down the, in the midst of the stones of fire. <clears throat> Thou was perfect in the ways uh, from the day that thou uh, was created, till iniquity was found in thee. By, multi uh, by the multitude of thy mercies, uh, they, have, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will. Now, I am going to tell you to do this on your own. On your own, go home. Look at Isaiah chapter 14. You know one of the worst things Christians can say? I will. I will do this. I don't care what anybody tells me. If you go to Isaiah chapter 14, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see Lucifer say, I will, five times. Now, I'm not going to go through all four of them because I don't want to keep you here all night. No, let's go. Anyway, but I'll tell you what the last one is. You know what the last I will of, of the devil was? I will be like the Most High. So he says, I will this, and then I will this, and then I will this, and then I will this, and when I am done, I will be like the Most High. You go get, there's no raise from there. There's no place to go up from there. And you ever hear anybody say this? I'll make you eat those words. You remember what uh, the first deacons meeting in the Bible, Numbers chapter 16, Korah, Dathan, and Byron? And they come up to Moses and Aaron and say, Moses and Aaron, you take too much upon you. And you know what Moses said to him? He didn't say you guys are wrong. You know what he said? You sons of Levi, you take too much upon you. He put their words back at him. So it's nothing that our God is going to beat the devil, but you know what he's going to do is make him eat his words. And so, so five times the devil said, I will. And watch what happens in chapter 28 of Ezekiel. Verse, middle of verse 16, I will. That's God's first I will. I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy the old covering chair from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted the, thy wisdom... Uh, by reason of thy brightness, I will, three, cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled my sanctuary by the multitude of thy iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. The devil's last I will is, I will be like the Most High. I am going to be God. God's last I will is, you'll be ashes on the ground. Brother, I can't think of any higher God where he wanted to be and any lower than ashes on the ground. Now let me ask you a question. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, over, I think it's in Matthew, that when he rebelled against the Lord, he said he made a place for who? Hell was made for who? The devil and his angels. You know why? Because he's going to throw them out of heaven. It's kind of like, it's kind of like you go, hmm. where do I throw him? So he made hell. Then he had a place. Now let me ask you a question. I might have said this before, but let me ask you a question. Don't raise your hand on this. I will raise mine. You ever been fired? 
Why do we say that? Why do we say you're fired? Why do you go home that day and say, honey, I got... Why don't you say this? Honey, I got disemployed today. We say, I got fired. Why do we say that? Because I'm sure anybody that ever got fired, your boss didn't come in, throw five gallons of gas on you, and light you. But you know, if you work with ceramics, you take clay, and you want to bake it, you put it in a kiln, and you know what they say you do? You, you fire it. So when the devil lost his job, God didn't say he got disemployed. He said he got fired. So from that day to this, when you lose your job, we say you got fired. Now, do you know why the devil hates you? Oh, it's not because you're living for God, because some of you aren't living for God. You know why he hates you? You got his job. What was his job? His job was to manifest the light of God, was it not? You know what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5? Ye are the light of the world. We got his job. And I can't prove this, okay, I can't prove this, but let me alone because I like to think it. I've often imagined, here is, here, is, here is God, and he tells the devil, stand on this earth, and he goes, you're fired. You're out of here. And can you see the devil? I mean, there is no other being as beautiful as him. And he says, where are you going to get a replacement for me? God said, step over there for a second. The devil steps over, and he reaches down a very piece of ground that he was standing on. <coughs> Hello, Adam. Meet your replacement. Could you imagine being fired because they got a guy that taught at MIT to replace you? I mean, you know, you got fired, but the guy that ran the space program replaced you. How about you got fired and got replaced by the pizza delivery boy? Couldn't put his baseball hat on sideways, showed this much of his underwear he walked, and half the time he forgot the pizza. <laughs> you know what the devil, this beautiful being who was manifesting the light of God, you know who he got replaced with? A dirt ball. That is known as adding insult to injury. Injury is he got fired. Insult is you and I replaced him. No wonder he hates us. Because if you got fired, you don't even know the guy that replaced you, but you don't wish him well. And if you hear that he accidentally set fire to the factory, I think I'll call him up. Hey, I, I see your new resident genius cleared off a place for a new, a new building. So what are you doing? Look at Revelation chapter 12. I'll tell you what you're doing. You're doing the devil's job. You see, if you ever got fired, you know what you had to do? You had to get another job. You get fired, you got to get another job. There's a lot of people that uh, they lose a job. They don't even go back into that field. And the devil couldn't go back into that field because... There was kind of like a corner on the market. So he had to find a new job. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 12. Look at verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a voice, a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. You know what his job was? His job was to manifest the light of God all across the universe. You know what his second job was? You know, he took the job after he got fired. He became an accuser of the brethren. Oh, man, do I really want to go here? <laughs> Now, I, I go out, you know, all over the country, and I preach, and I preach in Baptist churches. I preach in independent Baptist churches. King James Bible, believing independent Baptist churches. But I preach in Baptist churches. You know why? No, it's not because I think Jesus was a Baptist, and he started Baptist churches or anything like that. I preach in Baptist churches because Baptists do not gossip. Well, how's that for a response? 
Well, Baptists don't gossip. All right, look, let's check. let's check. How many of you are dirty, rotten, backstabbing, low down gossips? I already knew Simmons. You didn't have to tell me. <laughs> really? I've never found anybody to volunteer for that job description. So I go to Baptist churches because they don't gossip. But Baptists have a unique talent. They can spread the meanest prayer requests. I mean, they can split a church with a prayer request. They can put a preacher out of the ministry with a, well, we had you over today for Sunday dinner. We know you're new in the church and you're very excited about it. And, and we're very glad, you know, that we just, you know, because we love our church and our pastor, you know, but we just brought here because, because we just want you to pray about some things about our pastor. They didn't say we brought you over here so we could give you drugs. They didn't say we brought you over here so we could have you commit adultery. They just wanted to accuse the brethren. You know what's sad? Our job is his old job, the devil's old job of, of glorifying God, being the light of God. And instead of doing the first job he had, a whole bunch of us are helping him with the second one. We are accusing the brethren all over the place. <clears throat> I'll tell you this. I was pastoring upstate New York, and um, a guy stopped by my, my well, it's a parsonage, I was outside, he stopped in. He was a Bible believer, King James, he, he really believed it. And um, he, uh, he, he, he lived quite a ways away. I don't know why he was in Auburn at that particular time, but he, he lived quite a ways away. And he went to another church, and it was a good church, independent Baptist church, just wasn't a Bible-believing church, pastor used NIV. Now, this guy believed the King James Bible, his pastor believed the NIV. He's right, his pastor's wrong about the book. That's just a simple fact. So he's talking to me about his pastor, you know, and, and here's what he thinks. See, I think the guy's right and his pastor's wrong about the Bible being perfect. Do you understand? Well, he thought that automatically meant that I would jump on board with every criticism that he had. Oh, and you know, uh, the pastor wanted this and the church needed this, but the pastor wanted this, and so we had to get what the pastor wanted. And I didn't, I didn't jump on board. Oh, you know, and the pastor, he, he thought we should do this. Nobody really wanted to do that. We all had to do it because that's what the pastor wanted to do. And I didn't, I didn't amen him. He's, he's, he can't understand it. Because he thought that I was going to just, you know, rip his pastor's throat on every, on every point. And when he saw I wasn't reacting properly, he said this. He said, and you know, he spends an awful lot of time alone in the church building with the church secretary. And I said, wait just a minute. I said, are you now accusing your pastor of committing adultery with the church secretary? Oh, you should have seen it. He was such a good Baptist. He gave the same Baptist answer you would have. He said, I didn't say that. I said, no, you didn't. But I said, you sure implied it. And I said, I'm asking you a question. Because maybe he does. Maybe he thinks. Maybe his pastor is. I said, do you believe that your pastor is committing adultery with the church secretary. He went, no. I said, then don't you ever say that again. I'm not his pastor. I wasn't, I don't even know his pastor. His pastor walked in here tonight. I wouldn't recognize him. I wouldn't know his name. I don't know what he looks like. And I'd say he's wrong about the King James Bible. But I'm not going to jump on board just to accuse the brethren. And I told him, I said, you say something so, so flippantly like that. You throw out an innuendo like that so easy. And I said, you'll destroy a man's reputation. You'll destroy his ministry. I said, don't you ever do that again, ever. Now, here's what he does not know. Had he said yes, I just said, come on in the house. I said, give me your pastor's phone number. And I'd have called his pastor. I'd say, Pastor so-and-so, uh, this is Sam Gipp. I pastor Freedom Baptist Church in Auburn, New York. Are you committing adultery with your secretary? I'd say, would you do that? How else am I going to find out? He said, well, what if he said no? I'd say, well, one of your church members is standing here, and he thinks you are. You two need to have a talk. <gasps> you would turn a King James Bible believer into a pastor who doesn't believe the book? That's not the issue we're dealing with here. We're dealing with doing the devil's will 
accusing the brethren. And guys, we're good at accusing brethren. And we're good at accusing the brethren without ever openly accusing the brethren. Because <laughs> we just spread prayer requests. We just need to pray about this. This is heavy on my heart. I cry at night over this. Here we are, we're thinking the devil wants me to get drunk, and the devil wants me to commit adultery, and the devil wants me to commit fornication, and the devil wants me to kill somebody. And I'm not even going to say that he might not load your gun for you. But what he really wants you to do is he wants you to question that book. That's what he really wants you to do. What he really wants you to do, he wants you to get mad at God and shake your fist at heaven because God didn't follow your script for life. You told God what to do. Look, let me ask you a question. You ever have a problem in your life and you prayed about it? Okay. Now I'm going to tell you what you really did. Probably. You didn't say, God, take care of this. You know what you said? You told him how. Because that's what I always tell him. Whenever I have a problem in my life, I write out a script on how God should take care of this. I pass it on to him. Let me ask you a question. Does God know everything? then he must know I'm right. <laughs> and you know what God does? He reads my script, tosses it behind his back, and goes about doing what he wanted to as though he were God. <laughs> and so, maybe you said something. Maybe you said something you shouldn't have said. You knew it was wrong when you said it. Listen, listen God, I don't, any, I don't want any of you to kill anybody. Pastor doesn't want you to kill anybody. Now, if you're going to kill somebody, come and see me. I'll, you know, I'll give you some likely targets, but I mean, don't waste it, okay? Don't just run down the street and kill some nobody. We'll, we'll point you in the right direction. But um, some of you might question the book. Maybe the devil didn't tell you to question the book, but you're doing exactly what he wants you to. Maybe the devil didn't, didn't make you curse God. But boy, we did his job when we, when we did it. And some of us got so caught up with our own wonderfulness that we just think that we deserve all the power and all the glory available to us because we will use it properly. And we did exactly what the devil wanted us to do. And then we got on our cell phone and began to spread prayer requests because we don't gossip. And well, you know, I was just telling somebody to pray about it. And, you know, if they told somebody else to pray about it, and they told somebody else. And, well, it just came, well, you know, that's just how it happened. And we act so innocent. Well, I didn't want to hurt anybody. It's like it's like walking into a uh, it's like walking into a mall and spraying it with uh, whatever you spray it with, gun, one of those that they want to take away. And a bunch of people drop over dead and go, well, "I wasn't trying to kill anybody. I just wanted to, I just wanted to shoot in the mall." Yeah, I didn't plan to kill the preacher. I just wanted everybody to know what I thought of him. And we drop an accusation. And I'm going to tell you what I believe, guys. I really do. You know, I preach in churches like this one all the time. And I'm going to tell you what I think. Of the churches I preach in, the other ones, not just this one. I, preach, I think I'm preaching the best folks in the, in the area. You're saved. Straight on the book. Straight on your doctrine. I, I don't think we're talking about, I don't think we've got a bunch of secret serial killers here or child molesters or anything like that. I think... I think you're some of the best people in this area. When I preach in other churches, I think they are too, until I get the offering. <laughs> then I spread prayer requests about them. But um, <laughs> I think every person in this room, I think when you get up every morning, the last thing you want to do today is do what the devil wanted you to do. And yet how many times have we done it? How many times when I wasn't having a beer? How many times when I wasn't, uh, you know, committing fornication or committing adultery or killing somebody? How many times I wasn't doing that, but I was doing exactly what he wanted me to do because I wanted that power and that glory. And I wanted, to, I wanted to say something so that, have you ever done this? Now listen, see if this spirit ever spoke to you. Have you ever been talking to somebody? I'm talking to the preacher. Preacher mentions a name of somebody that I don't like, a Christian. And a little voice inside me says this, well, I'll see to it that by the time this conversation's over, he won't think as highly of him as he does right now. That's the accuser of the brethren. And so how many times have some of the best people 
in Idaho, some of the best people in the Boise area. How many times have we done exactly what the devil wanted us to? Because maybe we doubted the word of God. Maybe we said something to him we shouldn't have. Maybe we sought after power and glory. Or maybe we got on our telephone and we slung prayer requests like lightning bolts and left nothing but death and destruction behind us with the accusation of the brethren doing exactly. Some people, they say they want to serve God and they are assistants of the devil because we accuse the brethren. That's his job now, guys. Think about it. Next time you're about to say something on the phone, next time you're about to go on Facebook, guys, isn't this true? 50 years ago, if, if you did me wrong, you Christians did me wrong, I would tell God on you. Now I tell Facebook. Because <laughs> the animosity is quicker. God never did kill you when I wanted to. I can get, I can get a, what do they call it, flash crowd to see you at your restaurant and ruin your night. Guys, maybe, maybe you ought to do this. Number one, apologize to him. I'm not talking about confession. We talk about confession, and confession is confession, but maybe you just need to say you're sorry. I mean, if, if you sit here tonight saying, I want to serve God, don't you want to say, I want to serve God, I want to glorify God, I want to please Him, right? And while you've been doing that, you found out that you did what the devil wanted? Couldn't you at least say to Him, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my doubt. I'm sorry what I said in my anger. I'm sorry what I sought in my pride. And I'm sorry about what I said like I wasn't trying to kill him when I was. I'm sorry for accusing the brethren. Could you apologize? And if you apologize, then I would, exa I would advise you to stop doing it. Stop doing it when you know you are. And beware of the future. Because see, if you get it all right with God tonight, you have one problem ahead of you. It's called tomorrow. And tomorrow, after you made sure everything was okay, in tomorrow morning's snowstorm on the way to work, your car will blow up. And you'll get a chance to shake your fist at God all over again. Or someone will mention a Christian that you don't like and you have the opportunity to spread a prayer request. Or Satan will give you a shot at power and glory. Look, I, when I say I don't believe every promotion at work, I don't believe they're all of the devil. Do you understand? If you get a chance to be promoted, go for it. But you know when it's here. You know when you have been here, you say, it's about time. It's about time they, they appreciate a man of my caliber. 22 blank. Hollow point. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. I do believe this about this crowd. I don't think anybody here, if you knew the devil wanted you to do something, I don't believe anybody here would actively do it. But maybe we've been doing it by accident. Maybe we've been doing it while we've been watching Galatians 5. We've been stopped at Galatians, or Genesis 3 or Luke 4, Revelation 12. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. God, I ought to be a burnt spot behind a barn somewhere. I know I should. I'm so sorry. And I mean, I don't mean I'm sorry for what I've done. I mean, I am one sorry individual, God. I am so sorry. And Lord, these are good people. These are, I, I really believe these people desire to please you and glorify you. But while they've been watching Galatians 5, they've been bringing about Job 1 and fulfilling Genesis 3 and doing Revelation chapter 12 or Luke 4. Help them. I, can, I do not condemn any of them because if they've done any of the things that I just, told, I just talked about, God, it just shows that they're human. They're like me. They're like all of us. But God, help them. Somebody is asking you tonight to help them not make the devil happy, not help him with his new job, not worship him inadvertently by their goals. God, help these people, these folks who've come down I hear their apologies, God. Hear their apologies and bless them, God. Be merciful to them and bless them. 
And I pray, God, that they will then in turn bless thee. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. What have we got? Is our God. That's a good, that's a good song. 172. Folks have come. If you need to come, there is time. This is what church is about. Time to do business with God.